Good morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Welcome those of you watching on online. If there any time during the service you have a prayer need, text the number on the screen. Let us know how we can pray for you. There are people praying for us right now uh, in the uh, in the prayer room. So uh, just want to introduce our speaker, Jay Louder. Jay is from Wichita Falls, uh, Texas, and uh, he's an evangelist. He has a wife, three children. And God's going to use him to speak to you today. We had a lot of people respond in the early service. We're going to have some baptisms here in just a few minutes uh, after Jay preaches. So I just want you to be prepared to hear the gospel, be ready to respond to the gospel uh, today. I want to encourage you. Also, men, tomorrow night is Valiant Warrior. Uh, you need a ticket to, to come. We're going to have barbecue dinner, and Jay's going to be sharing. We've got a bunch of giveaways like... Uh, Matthew's bow, $500 gift cards, and it's all this kind of stuff. And so we want you to come. We want you to invite somebody to come. You can buy a ticket at, uh, at, in, out in the lobby, or you can uh, go online uh, at FBC Rogers slash uh, Valiant Warrior and, and buy a ticket. You can buy those all the way up to 3 o'clock tomorrow. So we want to see you here. We're going to be here. And then the ladies' event will be on Tuesday. And uh, also need a ticket for that. And then uh, Jay's supposed to be speaking to the students on Wednesday night, weather permitting. So we're trying to be optimistic about that. Let me pray for us and pray for Jay as he gets ready to come and preach for us. Father, we pray that your hand would be upon Jay and you would use him during this service. God, that you would use him to speak to us. And God, I pray especially for, for those that, that need Christ today. Those who are watching online, those who are in this room. Uh, those at our Olive Street campus, uh, Lord, we pray that you would, uh, you would bless the preaching of the gospel today. And we thank you that it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And Lord, we pray, as your word says, if, if perhaps you might grant repentance, Lord, that you would, you would grant that, you would call people to yourself today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, you can turn there quickly. I'm excited about being here this week and uh, each night, and uh, the women's night, men's night, of course, student night on Wednesday night. Matthew chapter 7, we're just going to launch right into the word, no need to delay. Uh, you would know this uh, passage, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's been a lot of debate over the years, what's the greatest sermon ever been preached? Well, undeniably, it's this. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Divided into three chapters, but one sermon. We're going to begin reading in verse 21. This is what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23, Jesus says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your spirit, use the power of your word to change lives. May your spirit walk down every aisle, speak to every individual, even those watching by video. In Jesus' name, amen. We were extremely excited to notify our son that for his birthday, we were going to be taking him to the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas. Why? It's because he was going to get to see his favorite NBA player, legendary guy by the name of Vince Carter. We shouldn't have told him three months early because he continued to ask every single day, when are we going, like to drove he and my, my, mother, my wife crazy. But finally the day arrived and we showed up early. We were literally the first people at the door. We knew that if you got there early, that even though we had the cheap seats up in the nosebleed section, that if you had a, a younger child, they would allow you to walk all the way down and you could literally, as long as your toes did not touch the floor, you could stand literally on the edge of the floor and you could watch them for the pregame warm-ups. Well, me and my wife and my, my son Lane were bolting our way down the steps and we didn't even honestly look up to see who was on the court. We get down to the very end, and there he is, my son's favorite basketball player. Now, you have to understand, my son collected basketball cards. He had a big poster on the wall that had Vince's moniker nickname, Vince Sanity, written across it. And those of you that are NBA fans know who he is. He played for the University of North Carolina. Incredible hops can jump out of the gym. 
And my son was hoping that he could take one of his basketball cards and he could get an autograph. Well, we're standing there, and basically the arena is empty. Very few people get there that early. I'm actually taller than Vince Carter, so uh, it, it was obvious that, that we could see one another. We just kind of stood there for a few minutes and took it all in. But again, we had an agenda, the agenda to, to get the autograph. And so we started hollering his name, Vince. Hey, Vince. Vince Carter. We eventually made our way to Vince Sanity. And there was no doubt he could hear us. I mean, there's very few people in the arena. My little five-foot-one wife put her elbow in my rib cage and said, what are you going to do now? we got to get his attention. Before long, I found myself looking like an idiot standing up in the seats with that poster swinging back and forth, calling Vince's name. Nothing worked. We knew he saw us. No doubt about it, but we couldn't get his attention. My son was getting discouraged, and more and more people were filtering in the arena, and it was becoming obvious that it was going to be just a few minutes before the, the visiting team was going to be walking through the tunnelway. And I came up with an idea. I told my wife, even though we're sitting in the nosebleed, why don't we sneak over? We can get over there where the visiting team walks through the tunnelway, and we will literally be right above Vince Carter, and there will be no way that he could deny this autograph from my son. We snuck our way. Finally got over there. My wife's a rule keeper and was freaking out that we were going to get thrown in prison. We snuck our way over there, and, and, and we're literally standing on this railway. There's a, a short rail guard in front, and, and we saw Vince just about to exit the court. There was some lady that obviously had more money than we did. She had courtside seats, and she was wearing a, a Vince Carter uh, jersey. And then when Vince walked within about a foot away from her, she stuck out her Sharpie to have him sign her jersey, and when Vince didn't sign her jersey, I turned to my wife and I said, we are in trouble. Well, finally, Vince becomes, he starts walking down the tunnel way, and it's, it's me and my wife and my son. I kid you not when I say that we were close enough to Vince that I could have literally reached over the deal, and I could have put my hand on the top of his head. That's how close we were. Now, it wasn't rehearsed, but you would have thought it was. Because when Vince got right below us, as if on cue, me, my wife, and my son, all at the exact same time, said, Vince, I will never forget it. As soon as Vince heard three people in unison call his name, Vince turned to look up to see who it was. You could literally watch his eyes look at my son, shift to my wife, and shift to me. And when he looked in the eyes of three people that he did not know, he turned around as if he never even heard us. My son was devastated. We eventually made our way up to the nosebleed section. And I have never cheered as hard as I have in my life for a visiting team to lose a basketball game. <laughs> and they did. My son would take posters off the wall. He would never collect another Vince Carter card again. But that night when the game was over and we were in the, my wife's Suburban, they were fast asleep. We had a two-hour drive to get back home and I'm pounding the pavement. And literally out of nowhere, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound spiritual because it wasn't a spirit. I wasn't driving down the road trying to think of spiritual things. I was replaying what happened at the game. When I first got saved, I made a, a commitment that I was going to spend my life memorizing God's Word. I have memorized a lot. One of the things I had done is I'd memorized Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. I wanted to build a quote to Sermon on the Mount. And as I was driving home, replaying what had happened as if it were a DVD in my mind, God reminded me of the, the verses that you and I just read together. I knew those verses. I could quote those verses. I could give you a theological explanation of those verses, but they never quite rang as deep as they did that night. Because as I was making that two-hour drive home, it was like God was reminding me of those verses, in essence, to say, Jay, in many ways, it was a visual illustration of the verses that I had read. Because Jesus had said that there were people who were fans. They, they wore the jersey. They, they talked the lingo. They, they talked a good game. They knew all the statistics and they followed from a distance. But there was never any real relationship. 
Jesus was saying that as he pulled back the curtain, he was letting us see what it was going to be like in those end days for multitudes of people. That in the same way, we knew all about Vince Carter. We knew his height. We knew his weight. We knew where he played high school basketball, where he played college basketball. We knew all of his current NBA statistics. But even though we knew all about Vince Carter, we never had a relationship with Vince Carter. And as I was driving down the road, headed back to Wichita Falls, it was like God was showing me that in the same way that when we called Vince's name, that because he did not know us, that in in a similar way, that was what Jesus was saying. That people would look at him, they, they, would, they, they knew everything about him, they had studied him historically, but in the same way Vince Carter did not know us, they did not know him. I wonder this morning, I know that there are people over to Olive that are watching this service, and of course it's a packed room here, and, and, and I wonder this morning about you. It's so easy in this day and age to be a fan of Jesus. There's a lot of people that wear the jersey. They talk the lingo, but they don't live the life. They go through the motions. They put on one jersey Sunday morning. Reminds me one time, another time I took my son to a, a Mavericks game. He, he brought a plastic sack, and, and, and he pulled out one jersey of Kevin Garnett because they were playing the Timberwolves and trying to get a Kevin Garnett signature. And then when he couldn't get a Kevin Garnett signature, he put that one in the bag and pulled out a Dirk Nowitzki and put that one on. And that's what many of us have been doing. We've been going through the motions. And that's my story. I don't have time this morning because of limited time because I preached too long in the early service. But, but that was my story. My mother taught Sunday school. We went to church all the time. My dad was a successful businessman. 54 convenience stores, North Texas, Southern Oklahoma. We were at church every time the door opened. When I was a young boy, Castle Hills Baptist Church, San Antonio, Texas. I walked an aisle. I really had no understanding of what I was doing. I had no real concept of repentance or what it meant to know Christ. And I walked down an aisle, and I got down here to the front, and somebody real quickly patted me on the back. Matter of fact, they had something that kind of looked like this and, and real quickly wrote down some information. And, and I just went through my life thinking that I was a true Christian. But I wasn't. There was no desire in my heart to really follow God. I didn't live like a Christian. I didn't talk like a Christian. We used to come to church on Sunday morning in high school. We come to church on Sunday morning with a hangover from the night before as believers. Or you could have asked me, tell you, hey, I've been baptized three times. My mom teaches Sunday school. I prayed a prayer. And I was lost. And when I was 21 years of age and I took out that 22 caliber pistol to blow my brains out, had I had done so because my roommate, thank God, came home from work early, and had he not have, I would have went straight to hell singing Amazing Grace. I could honestly, this morning, bring people into this room and put them on this stage that would tell you that Jay Louder was unsaved and shared the gospel with me and led me to Christ. Because I saw my dad do it. I went through the motions. And we've seen this all over the country. I mean, I've been preaching for a long time. I've been every mainline denomination. And it's amazing how many people that we've seen come out of choir lofts and come behind cameras and, 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 and literally preachers and preachers' wives and leaders in the church that say, I was never really saved. I wonder about you this morning. Do you truly know that your sins have been forgiven? I'm not asking you if you went through confirmation or you went through catechism. I'm not asking if you can quote information about Jesus Christ. Was there a time when he changed your life? My own mom said about me at 21 years of age, when I stumbled in that auditorium during an evangelistic service like this, thinking I was saved, that there was such a thing. And that night, Jesus Christ, by the power of his spirit, I wish I could intellectually explain it and ascertain it, but I can't. But that night, all I know is, is God removed the scales off my eyes and helped me see that I didn't know Christ. And that's why I'm so passionate about this portion of Scripture. Because I've been at this a long time, and I have seen, without exaggeration, people by the thousands. I had two people just a while ago sitting on the front row that walked by me. One, one man walked by me and said, hey, man, you told my story. I grew up in church. I was baptized like you, and I got saved at 21 years of age just like you did. 
And I've seen it over and over and over and over again. And hey, can I be honest this morning? I travel all over the world, and you know one of my favorite places to preach is, is when I go up north. I was invited, uh, I've been invited to Boston several times, and people say, man, you go to Boston, it's going to be tough up there. I'm like, no, it's not. I love preaching in Boston. Preach to the largest um, African-American church in Boston, second largest in all of New England. And the first service I preached at, we had like 150 people saved. See, when you go to the south, you come places like Arkansas and Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. Man, we've heard all this. We go, it's so easy to go through the motions. And there's a deception, and that's what Jesus is teaching here. It's people that have been deceived. Jesus is not talking about people that don't go to church. These are people who are devotedly religious, and you know how we know that? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says that these people are the ones who call him Lord, Lord. He's not talking about somebody who was out last night slamming heroin in their veins. No, he's talking about religious people. They called him Lord, Lord. If you look it up in the original language, it's the equivalency of one of my three kids calling me Daddy. Jesus says, not everybody who calls me Lord. They called him Lord. They never made him Lord. They called him Lord. You know what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4? That Satan is the deceiver of the unbeliever's mind. I spent all those years, up till 21 years of age, believing I was something I wasn't because I was deceived by Satan. Last night when I was laying in my, in my bed at, at the hotel room, I said, God, please unplug people's ears. God, please open people's hearts. God, please take the blinders off their eyes so they can see their true spiritual condition. Because Jesus is, is issuing really a, a warning shot here. And he says, they call him Lord, Lord, and, uh, but they won't enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, the people that enter the kingdom of heaven are the people that do his will. Hey, how are you doing in that department? I know you wear the label. Do you live the life? Is there a desire in your Are you seeking to obey God? Because he says it's the people not that call him Lord, but that do his will. We've got to move quickly. I want to kind of break this down as fast as I can. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the people that do my will the will of my Father. And then listen to this. This is amazing to me. Jesus actually, not only does he pull back the curtain and let us take a sneak peek into the end times, but he takes it even further, and he even lets us know what people are going to say. I wonder if there are people in the audience or watching by video that might make the statements that we're about to read. Notice the first statement they made. They say, Lord, I mean, we prophesied in your name. Do you know that in the Great Awakening, over 500 ministers were saved? 500. When Billy Graham stood in Madison Square Garden, ministers that had been pastors and leaders of churches, just in one service, one service alone, now he was there for several months, but in one service alone, the where they had the most, they had 72 ordained ministers that came forward in Madison Square Garden. That's not my figures, that's the Graham figures. 72 ordained ministers came forward at the gospel invitation and said, I preach the gospel. I am the leader of such and such denomination, and I have never been saved. Jesus said, there's a group of people that are going to say, I prophesied in your name. Now, that could encompass not only being a preacher of a church, but it could also encompass someone who shares the gospel. I mentioned a while ago, my father was always somebody that, uh, was always a person that shared uh, his faith, always. And because I wanted to be like my father when I was young, I started sharing the gospel. I wasn't even saved, but I led people to the Lord. And Jesus says there are going to be people that say, wait, Lord, wait a minute, now hold on. You know me. You know me. I was vocal about my faith. I mean, I mean God, I mean, there, there's a misunderstanding here. I mean, I, I, I told people at school, I, I, I told people at, at work about you. I never knew you. The second group Jesus talks about, he says, they cast out demons in your name. So you don't believe in demons. You don't believe in spiritual war warfare. And I wish that God would give us some kind of an x-ray vision or something because even right now in this room, even though you can't see it, there is a spiritual battle taking place right now. Can I get an amen? Does anybody believe that? 
Literally right now in this room, there is a battle. Now we can't see it to point towards it, but there is a battle taking place right now to try to keep people from hearing the truth, to try to keep people from getting their lives right with God, to try to keep people from getting their baptism on the right side of the cross, to try to get people distracted with work and what's going on around them. And these are people that said, we cast out demons in your name. Imagine having such a power on your life that by the name of Jesus that you could cast out demons. I've seen demon possession. I know you may not believe it, but I do. I've seen a 16-year-old girl throwing grown men around a room in Des Moines, Iowa, like they were Barbie dolls. The third group says this. They says, um, um, but, and we've done many wonders in your name. We did good works. Oh, this is the one I hear more than anything. I mean, I, I do good things. I'm, I'm, I'm not, we always measure ourselves. I mean, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And I, I do a lot of things right. And, you know, I, I volunteer. I go to church. I, we, we get this whole long list of things that we do. And, and, and these people are standing before Jesus Christ, and, and they're, 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 they're making their plea. They're, 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 they're trying to give their reasons. And, and then Jesus says what I believe might be the saddest statement in all the Bible. Jesus says, and then I will say to them, I don't know. But you, you, you need to hear. Can you listen? Listen. Can you imagine what it's like to look into the face of the living God? To look into the eyes of the Son. down his cheek and he said I, I don't know you dear God I'm telling you I, I, somebody said even this morning before I got up to preach one of the staff guys said man you don't smile a lot I said it's not because I don't take it's not because I take myself seriously it's because of what I do it weigh it weighs on me because I know that every time that I stand up and speak God's word that it's possible that it may be the last time somebody ever has the opportunity to get saved because in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, what if these people walk out the door and one day they remember that Sunday morning when they were there and they look into the face of the Son of God and hear Him say, I don't know you. I don't know you. Depart from me. asking if you prayed a prayer when you were young like I did. I'm not asking if you were baptized three times like I was. Is the evidence in your is your evidence in your life that Jesus lives there? The Bible says that you're to examine yourself whether you're to be in the faith. Even the Bible says that you ought to be able to see if you can extract from your life evidence and proof that Jesus Christ really lives there. Is it possible? You say, well, Jay, wait a minute, man. I mean, nobody can really know for sure. I mean, you know, I'm just going to kind of wait it out and see how it all unfolds. But the Bible says you can't know. And I can't help but believe. Maybe it's people watching on video or maybe it's you. You've been struggling with this for a long time. Today's the day to get it right because there may never be another moment like this. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed. There's nothing mystical about this. I just want you to bow your head and close your eyes because I don't want you to be distracted by what's going on around you. I don't want you to be focused on whatever's happening this afternoon. Just for a minute, I want you to take a deep look into your own life and see, have your sins really been forgiven? A 
again, the question is not if you went through catechism or confirmation. It's not even if you've been baptized. The question is, do you know that you know that Jesus Christ lives in you? I wonder if I talked to your mom and your dad, your husband and your wife, would they say that there's undeniable evidence that Jesus Christ lives in you and has changed you? That April 5th night at 21 years of age, when I stumbled in that auditorium, good Southern Baptist boy with a rich daddy. That night, by the Spirit of God, I realized I was lost. The preacher quoted John 3, 36. He said, the he that has a son has life, and he who doesn't have the son doesn't have life. And I knew that was me. I didn't have life. I was existing. I can't help but believe that there are many people in this service like there was in the early service. You may be a visitor, you may be whatever, Methodist, bad, maybe none of that. It doesn't even matter. You might be somebody that teaches Sunday school. It doesn't matter. What I want to do, if you're one of those people like there were many in the early service that would say, Jay, I don't know for sure. What I want to do is, is I want to lead you in a prayer. Now, I want to make something clear. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you're saved by praying a prayer. You heard my story. I prayed a prayer I didn't know or understand. I remained unsaved. I was religious, but I was unsaved. You're saved by faith. Faith in what? Putting your trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Believing that He died on the cross and then on the third day He rose from the grave. You say, Jay, that's it? You mean just, it means that you are willing to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your God and your Savior. It's that simple. And one of the ways that we do that is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, whoever, well, Jay, I've been too bad. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever. So what I want to do is, if you're in this room anywhere and you say, Jay, I just don't know for sure. Maybe you would say, Jay, at one time I thought I knew, but I just don't know for sure. I want to lead you in a prayer. You're not going to put your faith in the prayer. It's just going to be your way of calling out to Christ. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it silently right where you're seated. It's a prayer I've seen literally tens and tens and thousands of people pray. So if you'd say, Jay, I'm just not sure, but I want to be sure. I want to get this thing nailed down. I don't ever want to doubt it again. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Not putting your, your faith in the prayer, but you're putting your faith in Christ. It goes something like this. Dear God, Thank you for speaking to me today. God, I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I want to be forgiven of my sin. And so right here, right now, Jesus Christ, by your power, I want to repent. I want to turn away from my sin. Jesus Christ, I am inviting you into my life right here, right now, to save me. Come into my life. I don't ever want to doubt again. Jesus, I receive you right here, right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, whether you're Catholic or Baptist or Methodist or atheist or agnostic, doesn't matter. Whether you you may be a Sunday school teacher, you may be a one-time visitor, doesn't matter. With every head bowed and every eye closed, without and I, again, I won't embarrass you in any way. If you just pray that prayer with me, would you just lift your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Just lift it up high. Just lift your hand up high. You say, Jay, I just prayed that prayer with you. Lift it up high. There's people all over this auditorium. Lift it up high. Nothing to be embarrassed of. Just keep it up for just a minute. You may have been in church all your life. You may be visiting today. Anybody else say, Jay, I just prayed that prayer with you. Anybody else quickly? Just lift it up. Keep it up for just a minute. Anybody else? Jay, I just prayed that prayer with you. Hands are still going up. I don't want to miss anybody. Anybody else say, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you. I truly invited Christ in my life. I don't, I, anybody else quickly? Hands are still going up. Is there anybody else? 
Hands are still being raised. Literally all of this auditorium. I see young people, moms, dads, anybody else. Jay, I just prayed that prayer with you. Invited Christ into my life. You may have even prayed that prayer when you were six or seven, like me, but you didn't understand what you were doing. Anybody else? You may put your hands down. I want to ask one other quick question. You know, I mentioned that I was baptized three times. Technically, you can't call it baptism because I wasn't baptized. I was dunked. But then after I got saved at 21, initially I thought, you know, I don't need to get baptized. I've done that three times. But then I realized that the very first step of obedience is baptism. And I realized that even though I was baptized or dunked at the Baptist church before I got saved, that it, it really wasn't valid because you can only get baptized after you get saved. I can't help but believe that there's many of you that are like I was. Now, maybe you were christened when you were a baby or you were sprinkled, or maybe, like me, you, you actually were baptized before you got saved, and, and, and you've never gotten your baptism on the right side of the cross. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you either. But if you're one of those people that would say, Jay, my baptism's not on the right side of the cross, but it needs to be, pray for me. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? Just lift it up. Just lift it up high. I'm not going to embarrass you. Jay, my baptism's not on the right side of the cross, but it needs to be. I got sprinkled, I got dunked, whatever, but my baptism's not right. You may put your hands down now very quickly. I want to ask every head still be bowed, every eyes closed. But those of you that raised your hand that said, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you a while ago, would you lift your head right quick and look this way? Those of you that said, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you, only those of you that said, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you, will you lift your head and look right this way at me? You can just put your hand down, but lift your head and look right this way at me. Those of you that said, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you, just lift your head and look right this way. There's probably, I don't know, I'm going to guess 30 of you, I don't know. Maybe 40, I, I don't know. I'm not up here counting. But I know there's people all over this room that said, Jay, I prayed that prayer with you. So if that was you, just lift your head and look right this way at me. I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to be hard. I'm going to give you the privilege to go public. For some of you, that's really going to be hard because you're going to be so concerned about what everybody else is going to think rather than what God thinks. I truly believe that if you can't stand for Christ in a church on Sunday morning, you will never stand for Christ in a lost and unbelieving world. I believe that. And I believe there's something that happens when you make that public stand. Not only does it enable other people to pray for you, but it develops accountability. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is, I'm going to ask you in just in a minute, I'm going to say a quick prayer. The second I say amen, the worship leader is going to begin to sing. And I'm going to ask every one of you, the 30, 40 of you, whatever that number is, that are lifting your, have your heads lifted. You said, Jay, I prayed that prayer. I'm going to ask you unashamedly to immediately get out of your seat, come to the front, stand facing me. We're going to have a quick word of prayer together. I don't want your money. There's nothing to sign up for. None of that. It's you making your stand for Christ. The second I say amen, you may be the only person that comes. Nobody else may have the courage to do it. But the second I say amen, I'm going to ask you to quickly get out of your seat. Come stand facing me. Nobody's going to ask you to say anything. You're not going to be embarrassed in any way. Just when I say amen, you get it from where you're seated and come. So quickly, everybody stand. Everybody stand quickly. Everybody stand quickly. Everybody stand. When I say amen, you just come quickly stand facing me. Father God, I thank you for speaking to many this morning. Give them the courage to make that stand for you. In Jesus' name, as he sings, just come, come on right now. Don't wait. Lord. Just make your way. Say excuse me. And just make your way right here in the front. Stand facing me. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with 
I'm going to ask those in the audience just be praying. There's people around you. There's so many people that did not make it up here that need to be. We're going to sing just one more verse. We're not going to drag this thing out. Nobody's going to beg you to do what God's telling you to do. But there's still many of you that God has spoken to you. And this is your opportunity to make your stand for Christ. If you come, your husband and your wife may come. Your friends may come. Will you just say yes to Christ if you're coming? As a matter of fact, you may have brought somebody with you. You might turn to them and say, hey, I'll go with you. If you're going to come, come now as we sing one last verse. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are lot of courage to do what you've done as the van continues to softly play. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you will, give us just a couple of minutes. There's nothing to sign up for. I've written some information that I want to send to each and every one of you. It's free. It's just kind of a next step thing. And I've got some friends here that want to pray with you before you go. Nobody's going to leave you behind. If you would, just give us a couple of minutes. Don't go back to your seat. Just turn to my right and my right and your left and follow this guy with their hands waved. Just quickly, all of you, if you would, go this way. Just all of you, just go right this way. And those of you in the audience, just giving a hand clap for, the, for those.